Hello, I'm David Canadine, and I've recently been appointed the new editor of the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, one of the great scholarly enterprises and cultural resources uh, produced by Oxford University Press and closely associated with the history faculty of the University of Oxford. Uh, it's a great enterprise that has meant an enormous amount to me in my own professional life as a historian. Uh, I've consulted it constantly uh, and I'm always amazed at the range and variety of the biographical essays. Uh, I've contributed various uh, essays to it myself uh, and I'm hugely looking forward uh, to taking this great enterprise forward into the second decade of the 21st century. The Oxford Dictionary of National Biography is the supreme compilation uh, of thousands of lives of Britons uh, across two millennia uh, of history and across and around the whole of the globe where Britons have made history uh, often for good, uh, sometimes not so much for good. Uh, and so at one level what it tells us about ourselves is who all these people are and why they matter and what they've done. But it doesn't just tell us about these accumulated individual lives, because collectively these lives add up to something more, something bigger, perhaps something more important. They tell us what it means perhaps to have been English, certainly now to be British, and it, they tell us how we think about ourselves as a nation. And by the same token, uh, what the ODNB does is, in the very act of doing that, itself become a major component in our national culture. So in all sorts of ways, uh, it's not just a terrifically important enterprise, uh, it is in many ways an unrivaled enterprise in helping us to understand what sort of a nation we have been and where we are and where perhaps we might be going. There are many reasons why it's a huge pleasure and honour to be taking over as editor of the ODNB, not the least of which is that it's an astonishingly thriving organisation and has been so well led uh, by the late Colin Matthew, by Brian Harrison and most recently by uh, Lawrence Goldman. So in some senses the most important thing for me to do as general editor is to keep doing what they started and established and have embedded. Uh, beyond that, uh, I'm particularly concerned that we should carry on uh, with the programme of updating earlier entries and including new lives from past times where information becomes available that didn't exist before. And in that sense, the ODNB is very properly, constantly uh, a work in progress. It's also the case as we move through the early 21st century uh, that of course people keep dying and that's terrific news for us because it means more entries to include as we go forward. Uh, and one of the biggest entries that I'm looking forward to pondering uh, and thinking about commissioning uh, is that of Margaret Thatcher, uh, which we hope to publish uh, early in 2017. I'm also very interested to think about the ways in which the ODNB can tell us much more than we already know about the First World War, which is going to be preoccupying all of us over the next four or five years. Not just about uh, the lives and deaths of glittering but doomed youth, but also about the lives of many people that we have recorded who survived the First World War, either in the trenches or working back in Britain. And I think as we look at those lives already recorded in the ODNB of experience in the First World War, this will enable us to open up a whole set of new perspectives uh, on that terrible and at the moment, understandably, uh, preoccupying conflict. Uh, and I suppose I'm also concerned, looking forward, uh, to strengthen the connections between the ODNB and many other organisations with which we either have or hope to have uh, extremely good relations. Obviously the National Portrait Gallery is one, but I'm thinking also of English Heritage, uh, of the National Trust, of the Royal Academy, and again, back to the issue of the First World War, uh, the Imperial War Museum. And a final interest of mine, given that I actually work full-time in America and therefore have a kind of transatlantic, dare I say it, global perspective on the ODNB, is that I hope to be on the road and take to the air and uh, strengthen our connections with equivalent enterprises in other parts of the world, especially, I think, North America uh, and South Asia uh, and Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so 
taking what is in many senses a global enterprise and making it, I hope, even more global than it already is and helping it to reach an even broader audience uh, is something else that I look forward to doing uh, in the next five years. So there's lots to do. Uh, I can't wait to get started, but uh, I shall always be mindful of the fact uh, that this will merely be uh, occasional embellishments to what is already an astonishingly flourishing enterprise, which I feel hugely privileged and honoured uh, to be leading forward uh, into the later part of the second decade of the 21st century. I'm sure that all of you will have your own favourite entries in the ODNB from the many thousands that you can choose from, and I've certainly got plenty of favourites of my own. Uh, but uh, I'd just like to mention two of them very briefly, uh, if I may. The first is Paul Addison's marvellous entry on Winston Churchill, one of the longest entries in the whole of the ODNB, um, and appropriately at the early end of the alphabet. Uh, it's a wonderful entry because Addison is one of the most accomplished and well-versed uh, writers on Winston Churchill. And what he manages to do in that piece is not only to convey Churchill's extraordinary career, uh, its strengths and its weaknesses, uh, its greatnesses, and in some ways perhaps its errors and its follies, but he's able to do so in a very balanced and even-handed manner, which makes his piece very authoritative he does pays full tribute to Churchill's extraordinary achievements during the Second World War, but also sees Churchill's life in a broader historical perspective, which helps us to understand why in 1940 many people were appalled at the prospect that he would become Prime Minister and were amazed when he turned out to be the greatest British war leader ever. So it's a marvellously nuanced and vividly evocative piece which conveys the brilliance and the shortcomings of Churchill's larger-than-life personality. It gets him wonderfully well in a broader historical perspective. Um, and if you want a short account of Churchill's life, this is simply the best there is. My second choice comes from the other end of the alphabet, uh, is Virginia Woolf. Uh, I partly choose her because she was the daughter of Leslie Stephen, who first set up the original dictionary of national biography. But I also choose her because uh, Lyndall Gordon, in her very brilliant account, manages to make the point that one of the things that Virginia Woolf did as a novelist was to talk about interiority, uh, the internal lives of the people about whom she wrote as a novelist, that that was one of her great innovations as a novelist. And one of the things that Lyndall does brilliantly in this entry is to do that on Virginia Woolf herself and to evoke the life of her mind, the tortured mind, uh, and the, in some senses, rather disturbed and perhaps occasionally unbalanced psyche by which Woolf was both blessed and blighted. And I also choose Woolf because one of her activities as a writer and as a campaigner was constantly to make the point that there were many, many women's lives that appeared to have been lost to the official historical record. And one of the things that we are much concerned about here at the ODNB, and have been since it appeared in its new guise in 2004, is not just to take note of Virginia Woolf's observation, but also to try to do something about it. Uh, and we give a lot of attention to trying to discover uh, the lives of women that have been too often lost to history. Um, and in doing that, uh, we are following very much Virginia Woolf's uh, injunction and practice in her own life. So the Virginia Woolf entry is a marvellous entry because it's beautifully written and vividly evocative of this complicated woman of many different identities and guises. But it's also because here at the ODNB we are trying to do something that she uh, urged her contemporaries to do and would, I hope, approve of the way we're trying to do it. That is to say, to rescue the lives of too many women too long forgotten from the historical process. <laughs>